Uh, thank you all for coming. It's really exciting to see so many people here excited to learn about all kinds of cool things about our universe. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the organizers for putting all this together and giving me the opportunity to talk to you all. My name is Aryan. I'm a physics graduate student here at Caltech. And today I'm going to be talking to you guys about bringing imbalance to the universe. Uh, this is kind of the motivation behind the research I do here at Caltech. So I hope by the end of this, you'll be able to have an idea of why we're interested in the questions that we ask in my lab. Um, so here I have two pictures of butterfly. Obviously one is symmetric, so it looks the same if you flip it. And the other one looks different. And this is a really, really important concept in all of physics. So first I want to start from the basics. What do I mean when I say symmetry? Um, and when you think of symmetry, you should think of when you change something, can you notice the difference? So every symmetry involves applying some operation and then seeing, can you tell that you've done that? So here I have two GIFs. Actually, both of these are animated, uh, and they're both rotating. But as you can see, the circle, it's really hard, if not impossible, to tell that it's rotating. We say that the circle is rotation symmetric. No matter how much you turn it, it looks the same. But the square here right, only looks the same every time it rotates 90 degrees. So it has less symmetry than the circle. This is a really important concept because symmetry is all around us. So you might ask, is nature symmetric? And if nature is or isn't symmetric, should the models we use to try to understand nature, should those also be symmetric? So in nature, you can find a lot of examples of symmetry. In some plants, this is, for example, rotationally symmetric. If you rotated it, it would look the same. This butterfly is mirror symmetric. Um, you have other symmetries. These are some really cool broccoli that have like a spiral pattern. So a spiral uh, is rotationally symmetric as well, but if you mirror it, it doesn't look the same. Galaxies have a certain symmetry to them. And then there's some things in nature that are just not symmetric at all. Here's a picture of a flounder. Uh, as you can see, the eyes actually over the life of a flounder migrate to the top of the fish so that it can look up and see if there's anything above it, while the mouth still remains kind of sideways. And then here's that butterfly again. You can also see I've brought some asymmetry with my hair to the conference today, to the talk today. Um, <laughs> But so this is a really important topic for uh, scientists and for physicists because we want to build models for nature. We have to understand if nature is symmetric or asymmetric. We say these things are asymmetric. Um, and so physicists care about really fundamental f symmetries. We care about like, the most basic symmetries you can think of. And the way we conceptualize these is we say, OK, imagine you're sleeping and someone applies some operation to the universe. And then you wake up. Can you do an experiment to tell the difference? Can, if you can tell the difference, then that's not a symmetry. And if you can't tell a difference, then it is a symmetry. So one example here, I've got my, uh, you're sleeping here, you've got a clock and you've got a ruler. Um, the first symmetry that I want to talk about is charge symmetry. So we say that all around us, we're made up of atoms. They're these really tiny things. Atoms have pluses and minuses, right? A battery has a plus and a minus side. It's the same idea. What if we swapped all the pluses and minuses in the universe? And I've depicted that with this sort of black and white sort of inversion of the color. Um, <laughs> Would you be able to do an experiment to tell the difference? Originally, over 100 years ago, scientists thought, nah, this must be a good symmetry. You can't tell the difference. There's no difference. Positive and negative are arbitrary. Another one you can ask is, what if you reverse all directions? We call this a parity uh, operation. You can think of it like a mirror, right? What if I, you, you're asleep and I swap all of left and right up and down? Can you tell the difference? And physicists used to think, well, of course not. The universe shouldn't care what direction you call up what direction you call down, our rules should be the same. And the last one you can do is you can reverse time. So you say, oh, if I run the clock backwards, if I run the movie backwards, do I have the same universe? Could I still figure out if there's a difference? Um, and so for all of these, scientists used to, used to think before 100 years ago that these were perfectly good symmetries of, of our universe. And all their models incorporated these symmetries. But actually, over the last 100 years, scientists have discovered that all three of these symmetries are broken in some way when you start considering like the really small fundamental processes in our universe. So individual symmetries can be broken, but actually you can imagine another symmetry. What if I do all three of these? What if I flip up and down? What if I turn all the pluses to minuses? What if I reverse time? Can you tell the difference in that universe? We call that CPT. And actually it turns out this CPT universe, this universe where you've switched all these things, it's totally indistinguishable from our own. We think it should be indistinguishable of our own. If it's distinguishable, we have a lot of issues in our theories. But OK, why am I talking to you guys about all this? Because I really want to focus on this symmetry of charge. What happens when you reverse plus and minus? In order to do this, I first have to introduce the idea of atoms. And we can do this really quickly. So all of us are made up of these really tiny things called atoms. To give you a sense of scale, think of how small a bacteria is compared to a human. Now blow up a bacteria to the size of a human, 
and an atom will then be the size of a bacteria. So they're really, really tiny. They consist of a, a positive center, a proton, and an electron, which is negative, and it, instead of drawing it orbiting around, I've drawn it as a cloud, because there's kind of a probability you'll find it here, a probability you'll find it there. And this is a hydrogen atom. This is most of the stuff we know in our universe. Our universe, the stuff we know about, is made of something we call matter. So it looks like this. Uh, it's all over the place. It's the building blocks of life. All of the elements that we heard in an earlier talk are all made up of these positive centers and these negative kind of clouds. But actually, when you apply this charge operation, when you switch plus and minus, you go from matter to something called antimatter. You might have heard of antimatter in science fiction, but it's real. It's real, and we can produce it in a lab. Antimatter, an antiatom, looks just like an ordinary atom, but now instead of a positive center, the center is negative. We have an antiproton. And instead of a negative electron, we have a positive electron called an anti-electron. Antimatter is only produced in sort of exotic processes. It's actually produced in radioactive decay. Uh, it's used in PET scans. If you've ever heard of a PET scan, they use antimatter. Um, and it's pretty much 0% of our ordinary universe. We don't see it in a free form. We can produce it in a lab, though. Um, and the last thing that's important here is that when antimatter comes into contact with ordinary matter, they annihilate. They turn into light. So both of them are destroyed, and we get energy instead. Um, and this is really important because it turns out we need an imbalance of matter and antimatter in the universe in order for me to be here today talking to you guys. And that's really cool because it goes against our intuitions of everything in nature being kind of symmetric. We need an asymmetry, an imbalance between matter and antimatter. And to elucidate that, I'm going to show you guys what would happen if we had a symmetric universe. So in physics, we think that the universe began with something we call the Big Bang. So everything was really small, focused down to a small point. It was hot and dense, and it exploded out. And all of this was at high energy, and eventually it got bigger. The universe got bigger. Everything cooled down, and we're here today. And if you go way back, and this was 13.8 billion years ago. So if you go way back then to the Big Bang, to the beginnings of, say, the origins of our universe, imagine everything was symmetric. I mean, here I've got matter as m and antimatter as a. If we had equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the early universe, which is what our current models actually say, they, they, don't, they say there should be equal production of both, then they would cancel each other out, right? I told you when matter meets antimatter, they annihilate into energy. And so we would be left with no matter, no antimatter, just energy, and we wouldn't have our universe today. I don't know what we would have. It would be all kind of energy maybe, who knows? But we wouldn't be here today. The fact that we're here today and the fact that we don't observe any antimatter tells us that there had to be an imbalance to get here. So what does this look like in an imbalanced universe? In an asymmetric universe, which is a, I'm using the word asymmetry and imbalance kind of together, um, you have more matter than antimatter. When these two come together, they cancel out, but there's a little bit of matter left. That little bit produced us. Eventually, this will, little bit of matter goes on to produce galaxies, planets, Earth, solar systems, um, you know, my homework, uh, all these things. <laughs> and so maybe it would have been nice if I were in this universe. Um, but now we can look at the amount of stuff in our universe and back out what this imbalance was. And we think that this imbalance was about one in a billion. So for every billion antimatter particles, there was a billion and one matter particles. And that one that was left over, that little bit, right, gave us sort of our universe today. And this is where my research comes in. What we want to know is we want to know what caused this imbalance to occur. Right now, we don't know of any processes that could give us this billion in one imbalance. So can we discover the origins of this imbalance? So we have an imbalance of matter and antimatter that gave us our lives today. That means that the laws of physics are not symmetric. They have some asymmetry to them. Can we look for this in an experiment? And that's what my lab does. So let's go back to that picture of the atom we had. I told you that the electron is some probability of being all around here. But let's say we do a measurement. We find that the electron's in this corner. And you, know, you can think of the electron as like a round ball of negative charge. And what we do in our lab is we want to see, can we find an example of an asymmetry in the electron? So we do a really precise measurement to look at the curve, to see how round the electron is. And if the electron has a little bump, if this fundamental particle is not symmetric, has a little asymmetry of its charge, then that can explain to us, depending on how big this bump is, that can tell us where the imbalance of matter and antimatter came from. So these are ongoing experiments all over the world. What that you do is you have a cold gas of molecules. You use lasers to sort of do a really precise measurement on the electrons inside those molecules. And the best results people have found so far is that the electron looks round. 
and it looks round to an astonishing precision. There's still room for us to have more asymmetry, but if I were to give you a sense of how well they've measured the roundness so far, it would be like measuring the roundness of the Earth to the resolution of uh, the size of a protein. So it's really, really precise measurements, but it turns out there's a lot more room for us to go. So you could have an even smaller asymmetry than that, and that would be enough to explain. Remember, a billion and one is a really small number. So here's a picture of my lab. Uh, we're a new lab at Caltech. We actually have been you know, in our space for about a, a year now. Um, and uh, you can come by and check us out on the, our website. You can come by, uh, the building is called Downs Lordson. We're on the first floor. Uh, and here's kind of a picture of the apparatus we use. This orange box here produces really, really cold molecules, as cold as outer space. They come flying out here. And now we're in the process of building a whole experiment involving electric fields and magnetic fields and all kinds of like shielding and control electronics to do this really, really precise measurement of the electrons that are really cold and to see, do they wobble a bit when they spin? Because if they wobble, that tells us they're a little lopsided. So we're interested in discovering uh, if these electrons are lopsided because that can help us discover the origins of our existence today. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time.